He's been referred to as one of Arkansas's best kept secrets, world renowned composer Dr. Francis Macbeth of Arkadelphia. His works include more than 100 compositions for all media, choral, chamber, orchestral, and band. Macbeth's band compositions alone have earned him international recognition as one of the leading composers of band music. Macbeth's expertise is reflected in the fact that he served as president of the prestigious American Bandmasters Association, a post once held by the legendary band composer and conductor John Philip Sousa. For nearly 40 years, Macbeth served on the faculty at Washita Baptist University as resident composer and professor of music. A former conductor of the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra, Macbeth is credited in making classical music more popular for the people of Arkansas by becoming the first conductor in the orchestra's history to talk to the audience about the music they were about to hear. Today, Macbeth divides his professional time between compositions by guest conducting and lecturing. He has conducted in 48 of the 50 states, Australia, Canada, Europe, and Japan. Join us for a visit with the maestro in Arkadelphia for a most entertaining conversation with this composer, teacher, humorist, philosopher, and above all, one of Arkansas's men of distinction, Dr. Francis Macbeth. inside the studio of Dr. Francis Macbeth here in his home in Arkadelphia, where I guess uh, you've been known to work many a night late into the wee hours of the morning doing your composition work here. Tell us, uh, let's begin with your parents uh, who you credit as developing your interest in music. Both of my parents were good musicians and uh, they, they liked the kind of music that nobody else in school liked. And so I ended up being, I thought something was really wrong with me because I was the only one in my school who liked Brahms and Woody Herman. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, uh, but it was because of my parents, you know, you, when you grow up with good music and my mother was always the organist and pianist at the church and, uh, uh, and in church, there's only one section where you can play anything you want to play, and that's the offertory. She'd play anything she wanted to play. So she'd let me pick the offertory. And I was always picking Schumann. I grew up loving him as a little kid. So that was our personal concert. But th they, were, they were my big influences, they sure were. And then my high school band director was the next huge influence. Uh, he. He was quite a, quite a good man. He, he went back in the military from our high school, and I was in the service at the time, and they gave every bandmaster in the, in the Army an exam. And if they failed it, they had to go to the Navy School of Music for six months. And if they failed that, they had to get out. Well, he made the highest grade in the Army on this test, so they sent him to West Point. So he's band director at West Point, and then he went from West Point to the Field Forces Band in Washington, and then he had the Bicentennial Band in 76. And so uh, he was quite an influence on me because he was a great professional player. And we still see each other all the time, correspond, we're very close. Mm -hmm. I thought he was an old man when I was in high school, but <laughs> he was only four years older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Dr. Macbeth, while you were growing up in West Texas, I understand that you were a Golden Gloves champ. Is that correct? Yeah, well, actually, it was TAAF, which is uh, Texas Amateur Athletic Federation. I had to think. I hadn't said that in years, <laughs> which is kind of like the Golden Gloves. It's a different organization. I but uh, Yeah, I, I, I used to really box a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> well, uh... How did you go from boxing then to music? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, once, once I, I, I was fighting for the Grand Prairie Athletic Club in high school, and we were fighting 
this is when I decided I might quit. Uh, we were fighting Compton Citadel, and I had drawn this kid who was a tall, lanky, long, kind of long black hair, and he didn't know anything about fighting. And I was just cleaning his clock for the first two rounds there. Then, that, then that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> I woke up downstairs. I woke up and put my shoes on downstairs. He got in one lick and nearly killed me. <laughs> so I thought, boy, if you don't need to know anything about it and just be that strong, I, I may skip this. <laughs> Yes, when you decided maybe a, mu think, a musical career would be... I'll uh, lean more to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess your biggest fight uh, was yet to come when you accepted the position at Washita Baptist University as the band director there. And when you came on, there really wasn't a, a band. No, 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 no. <laughs> In fact, the head department said, we'll probably return about 45 players. Well, I signed up nine. <laughs> and uh, I, I went to the dorm rooms every night, finding I could find out on their entrance cards who played an instrument. And I'd go by their dorm rooms and con them into joining the band. And so in about a month, I had about 28, 29 kids doing pretty well, fair. You know. And uh, the uh, president was just thrilled. You know, I was so shocked because I was kind of embarrassed and he was thrilled uh, that, that I thought, gee, if he's this happy, now I may stick around here a little while because I can build a good one in three years. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a rough start. It sure was. And you never forget those nine kids you started with. <laughs> but you, you had no idea probably that you would uh, be there for almost 40 years. I was, uh, I've, I've been in town now 48 years. No, I didn't. I was just happy. I, I, the school was a great school. It's one, I think it's just one of the neatest small schools in the country. And I was just so happy with the people there and the people I worked with that uh, I just stayed. <laughs> I, guess I, came, so. I came at $4,000 a year. My goodness. Uh, that, that, was, that was a little harder than building a band. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you've always enjoyed taking a challenge and then conquering it, as was the case with the Arkansas Symphony Orchestra when you came on there as the director back in the 70s. They had more people on stage than they did in the audience. <laughs> and uh, B.D. Ford, who owned Bean Music Company in Little Rock, uh, was a good friend of mine, and he talked me into taking, taking the, the Arkansas Symphony. And uh, the, the, the first thing I did which was the smartest thing I did, was get all the high school kids out of it. Because high school and college kids, they used a lot of college kids. Well, these college kids are hung up in, at, at Conway. And, you know, if you got a rehearsal, they can't come. So I got rid of all the school employees. So I, I guess p part of your... Uh... The, I guess the magic that you worked there, you actually uh, got an interest in the average person to get an interest in classical music. I did, and I, I, I would go to the, certain, the clubs like Rotary and, and Lions and so forth and speak to them. Mm -hmm. And then I did something, I, I asked the Gazette uh, not to, I said, now don't criticize me the first year, but the second year you can say anything you want to say. On one thing, I'm gonna talk to the audience before the last work we play. And till this very day, I'll run into somebody in Little Rock and they say, Oh, I remember what you said about a such and such a piece. They don't, they don't remember the music really, but they remember what I said. And uh, if you can get the men interested, you got it made. Because the women already are. But if you can work the men into the concert program, mm -hmm. now, now you're doing something. I love that sound. I hate the other sound. So the more dissonant, the more you must, the more dissonant the chord, the more you must pull out the bottom partials. Let, let's go to that more dissonant while you still got that on your ear. Throughout his nearly 40 years at OBU, Macbeth had a definite teaching philosophy, saying that nobody ever learned anything if they weren't enjoying it. He always said that the worst crime a teacher can commit is to be boring. See, we got, we... And I would do anything to keep from being bored and boring, short of setting myself on fire. Because I taught theory, and theory is a subject matter that a lot of people are bored with, the subject matter. 
So you've got to kind of keep that alive. Keep It Alive he did for many students who went on with their own compositions and successful careers, such as Stephen Bryant, who now works at the Juilliard School of Music in New York. He was very, very funny and had a number of amazing stories always told, but he also had a very clear um, concept of how music should be created and how it should work. And uh, not to get too technical, but basically, uh, his phrase is economy of materials, or motivic construction. You're building a piece out of the smallest amount of material possible, like say four notes, and you call that a motive, and maybe a rhythm. And that's all you need for an entire piece, the entire melodic structure, harmonic structure, rhythmic structure, everything is generated from that one small motive. And that, in a nutshell, is what he taught uh, and taught me. Um, so that's the musical side of it. Uh, as far as, um, just as a mentor, you know, he's a great, great man, and uh, absolutely solid integrity, uh, honesty, and and straightforwardness. You know, he's very down to earth. And then there's Point of Grace. You guys help us out. Here we go. Come on now. Come together. These contemporary Christian recording artists went on to set a milestone in the history of American music, 24 consecutive number one hits. They were students in Dr. Macbeth's music theory class. He's world renowned and that he would choose to spend his entire career at Washita, you know, to me when he could be anywhere else in the world just says a lot about our school, I think, and, and a lot about him and just the relationship there. And so. Um, it was just really neat to be able to sit under him and in harmony class and one of the things I remember the most about him is just that he his passion for what he did. You knew that he really believed in in the gift that you were given and he wanted you to make the very most of it you know mm -hmm. and he didn't want you to skip the eight o'clock class right. he wanted you to be there to learn that French six. <laughs> I don't know what I would do with it today but probably write songs maybe. I don't know. But um, he was just, and, he, and not only that, but he was one of those, he is, I know still to this day, has to be, um, one of those kind of people that was just magnetic. Mm -hmm. He had a magnetic personality, very, very funny, very engaging in class, mm -hmm. you know, I just remember laughing and... And, you know, you <laughs> Both know, times she was there. Both no, times I'm I was there, it was hysterical. No, she loved it so much, she took it again. I did. <laughs> I did take it again. So, how do you compose? Uh, is there a, a motive, a, a central theme, or used to be called, I guess, uh, a melody? Well, actually, I start with a scenario before I go for the motive, or what used to be called a melody. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> See, we were sitting right here, and, and we decided to write a piece. Now, first thing, is it going to be a heroic, big piece? Uh, do we want a slow piece? If a slow piece, do we want it really bittersweet? Uh, yeah, that's what we'll do. I just wrote a piece, I called it A Rose for Emily. If you know that Faulkner story, that's really bittersweet. He said, okay, I'll come in with the strings on low, that's just a drone, and then I come in with the horns, the French horns in unison, and I don't know what they're gonna do, but I, I know what I want to, then when I decide, yeah, that's what we're gonna do, then I go for the notes. Mm -hmm. The notes are the easiest part, because there's only 12 of them in the <laughs> world, so you can find those a hunt and peck if you want to. <laughs> Well, you said even, even uh, say, Beethoven's Fifth began with just a, a, a melody. A motive. A motive. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Two notes done four times. Ja, da, da, dum. That's the second one. Ja, da, da, dum. Ja, da, da, dum. Ta, ta, ti, ti, ta, 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 dum. See, he's just taking these four notes, mm -hmm. two notes actually, and just it's called spinning them out, uh, mm. as opposed to having the big romantic melody. 
you know, the big melody. That's the... You can harmonize that. Anything can get away with it, you know, because <laughs> you had everybody doing that big melody. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, Beethoven was one of the very first. And Dvorak is the one that really uh, put it into use. And then Sibelius. Uh, Sibelius called it organic writing, meaning that everything comes you know, organic gardening, you throw all your stuff out there and it helps it grow. With organic composition, you come up with a motive and you use the intervals in that motive to make your chords and everything grows out of it. He called it organic composition. Mm. Now, Dr. Macbeth, you say there's a, a misconception, a misnomer uh, about uh, with a lot of folks about uh, computers and, and, and composing. Well, the computer in composition is really misunderstood. Uh, particularly by students because you know there at the end of my teaching I would have students come by and say I want to study some composition because I bought a computer program well no computer can compose uh, all they can do is play something back that you put in that's all they can do uh, all of your compo composing still has to come out of the, out of the noodle it, it just and kids get and I, I do comp symposiums at a lot of universities, and, and I always have one or two that I can spot when I'll meet with them privately and go over their music that, that write, who try to write at the computer because they will loop things and play it over and over and over and over. And, over. and it comes out sounding kind of like semi-serious disco, you know. So with what tools then does Dr. Macbeth carry out his compositions? Well, it's simple. A number two, a bo uh, Black Warrior, one of the best pencils in the world. Uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's too slow, really, to compose, and then, and then before you or and orchestrate it onto the computer. I can or I'm orchestrating a piece right here. It's much faster with a pencil. And, uh, but I would have to do that sooner or later to put it in, fi in a final finished form the way it looks. But my wife does that. And so it makes it so easy. So you put it on this, uh, and this is actually, uh, this is the way it looks like before well, you start. Yeah, well, it, 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 that's part of it. Well, yeah, for the parts. Uh huh. That, that's that's bolt Black Warrior number two. <laughs> and then your wife takes this on the, on the keyboard uh, right. over here, and then electronically then... Uh, she does, and she, she prints it out. And see, this is a new phenomenon, this being able to print uh, on the computer music, which is... is really made a big change. There is one other tool that Dr. Macbeth uses that's quite interesting, an antique organ. And here's the neat thing about it. I always keep my little short pencils because if I have a chord, a very dissonant chord, a big, big chord, and I want one up here, uh, I, can, I can set up my chord with my short pencils like this. And it's an E flat major up here. And I'm going to do a D flat down here. And so then I can go ahead and go right on down here and play. And you get both. That's what's called a polychord. But you, you, can, you can try out very complicated sonorities by, by using my short pencil. Well, isn't that something? Whatever works, huh? Whatever works. It doesn't matter what you do as long as it comes out. <laughs> That's right. Macbeth says he does his best work when he's composing late into the night. I'll tell you another interesting thing about composition, writing it, is there are two kinds of composers, those who work early in the morning and those who work late at night. And they write completely different music. Hmm. The ones that work early in the morning, they write a real classical style. Very thoughty, classical. And those who write late at night, write very romantically, very romantic style. They really write completely different. And uh, I don't know why that's true, but you know, I really can't think of Beethoven writing the Ninth Symphony before breakfast, can you? <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> but uh, uh, but they, it, they, when you write during, during the day, it makes a difference on your music. Our emotions run higher at night. You know, when, when we're sick, we're always sicker at night than we are in the morning. Uh, the vast majority of babies are born at night. 
I, I, just our emotions run stronger at night. I think that's why they write romantically. And when I say romantically, I'm not talking about the romantic period. Uh, even though it's 20th century, it can be 20th century romanticism and 20th century classicism. But uh, when you're hearing a piece of music that you composed, you're you're listening to it for the very first time, exactly the way you uh, wrote it down with your number two pencil. That must give you a wonderful sense of accomplishment. Well, it does when it happens, <laughs> because it doesn't always happen. Uh, I would say that 99% of the time, your music only comes up to about 85 to 90% of where you really want it to be. Every now and then, you'll get up to there, uh, but that's, that's pretty rare. Uh, and, and, and that is exciting to hear, what, hear it happen. Uh, the, with the uh, younger players, you have to work a long time to get it where you want it. But with the professionals, you know, just a couple, three times through and you're ready to go. So that's always exciting. I, uh, I did a concert two years ago with the Allentown, Pennsylvania band, the piece that they commissioned for their 175th birthday. They're the oldest non-military band in the United States in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, boy, it was just a joy working with them because you know it was right there where you wanted first time through, really the first, very first time through. So those, that, that's always a big relief and not near so much work. And what about the fondest memory that you have of conducting a piece? The fondest memory is the Marine Band. The Marine Band, there's none better. I could say in the world, but then that would take in the Kusai in Tokyo, and that's a great, great wind group. But in, in this country, it's, it's, it's the best band there is. And uh, I did a piece for their, t a commission for their 200th anniversary of the band, and not the Marines, but of the Marine Band, about five years ago, or six, and uh, I, I wrote a piece, and I, they wanted me to conduct it. So I went to, and I worked with them an hour each day for three days, and gosh, with people like that, that, it was, just, that was so much fun and so good that, that I had tremendous memories of that. What do you think is the best piece that you ever composed? Now, don't tell us that it's the next one you're going to do. I did. I, I said that for years and years and years. But then, uh, about oh, eight years ago, I wrote a piece for the Air Force uh, called uh, "Through Countless Halls of Air," mm -hmm. and it's the best thing I've ever done. Through Countless Halls of Air, that title comes from that poem that you've heard on TV all your life uh, that goes, I fling my eager craft through footless halls of air and touch the face of God. And I didn't, I, I didn't really like through footless halls of air, so I changed it to countless. But that's where that title came from. As far as retiring from composition work, Macbeth says you can't really retire from creativity. When you do things like, like this, you do them all your life. Uh, you don't really say, well, you like other jobs, you say, boy, 40 years, that's enough of that. You know, and I'm retiring. Which, uh, teaching, as much as I love teaching, 40 years was enough. But uh, with creative work, it, it goes on. It continues on. Uh, all, all people in creative, creative work are that way. They, they keep going on. So as long as Dr. Francis Macbeth is able. <laughs> yeah, as long as I can sit upright, <laughs> I'll keep, keep doing it.